So, we are in the story of Acts, and, and we're, you know, we're toward the end of it, actually. And we've seen ups and downs, highs and lows. We've seen the victories and the failings, both personal and churchly, of, of the people of God. And uh, now, last week, Paul was arrested. Uh, and Paul will never be free again. Last week was the last time Paul had, would ever walk as <coughs> a free man. And so this week, uh, he's in jail. And it's a, it's a rather long reading. Uh, it's, it's Acts 22, verse 30, to 24, verse 27. And I want to read the whole thing to you from the message. And I hope that you will just, instead of sitting up straight and breathing shallow because we're reading scripture, just sit back and listen. Listen to the story of what's going on with Paul. Because it's really important. Because, because Paul is in hot water. Paul's in a very difficult situation. And you know, that's, that's kind of when, that's kind of when you learn about people, is how they act under pressure, right? I mean, everybody, you know, everybody can be friends uh, sitting at a bar at the beach sipping a margarita. The question is, how do you act when things are going south, right? And, and we've all had times, it, most of us haven't had times like Paul, where, he, where things are going south for him, where he's in jail, or, People are plotting against him, trying to get him killed, even though he's under Roman protection, as you will see. But we've all had our own times when things are going south, things keep dropping on you, and, you know. Now, see, you're going to call me insane, because I'm doing the same thing over and over again, hoping for a different result. <laughs> Okay, well, here we go. So, <laughs> the reason this is important is because we're all going to face difficult situations. And, and they're going to be different for each of us because we all have our different weak spots. We all have our different pressure spots. But we all have times when we are tempted to bend or break the rules, the way God would have us live, bend or, or break our Christian morals and integrity for the sake of... Either it's in either we feel kind of panicked and desperate, and we don't know how to get out of the situation, so we feel like cheating our way out or something like that, or we feel highly desirous of something and ambitious, and and it's kind of within reach, and we feel like we feel like oh it's just right there, and that's what tempts us to cheat, to lie, or steal, or or belittle somebody else, or not not be truthful with other people, and so this reading this morning is really going to help us see. Uh, what's going on uh, in Paul's mind and how Paul operates when, um, when, he's, uh, when he's under the gun. And what I want you to listen for has to do with this verse right here. It's a verse I told the kids. Uh, Jesus told his followers, Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Be wise as serpents. That's very wily. That's, you know, knowing how to move within things. And that's the kind of thing. And then, of course, innocent is, is that uh, um, complete, there's no dishonesty or any of that kind of stuff. And so listen for Paul being wise and innocent as I read this to you. Okay, now sit back in your place. Pretend I'm not even here. Put yourself on the couch. Glass of wine, cup of tea, whatever you like. And listen to the story about Paul. He's in jail. The next day, determined to get to the root of the trouble and know for sure what was behind the Jewish accusations against Paul, the captain brought Paul out of jail and ordered a meeting of the high priests and the high council to see what they could make of it. And Paul was led in and took his place before them. Paul looked around at the members of the council with a steady gaze and then began to say his piece. Friends, I've lived with a clear conscience before God all my life up to this very moment. That set off the chief priest Ananias. He ordered his aides to slap Paul in the face, and Paul shot back. God will slap you down, you hypocrites. You sit there and judge me by the law, and then break the law you claim to uphold by ordering me to be slapped. The aides were scandalized and said, How dare you talk to the chief priests like that? 
Paul was surprised. I didn't know, brothers, that he was the high priest. You're right. The scriptures do say don't speak abusively about a ruler of the people. I'm sorry. Paul, knowing that some of the council was made up of Sadducees and others of Pharisees and how they hated each other, decided to exploit the antagonism between these two groups. Friends, I am a faithful, zealous Pharisee from a long line of Pharisees, and it's because of my Pharisee convictions that I hope for the resurrection of the dead. That's why I'm here today. The moment Paul said this, the council was split right down the middle. The Pharisees and the Sadducees started going at each other in heated argument. The Sadducees, they have nothing to do with the resurrection from the dead or, or angels or a spirit world. If they can't see it, they don't believe in it. The Pharisees, however, believe in all that kind of thing. So there was a huge, noisy quarrel between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Some of the religious Pharisees, scholars on the Pharisee side shouted down everybody, we don't find anything wrong with this man. What if a spirit has spoken to him? Or maybe an angel? What if it turns out we're fighting against God? Well, that was fuel for the fire. The quarrel flamed up and became so violent that captain was afraid they would tear Paul apart limb from limb. So he ordered his soldiers to get him out of there and escort him back to the barracks for his own safety. That night the Lord appeared to Paul and told him this, It's going to be all right. Everything's going to turn out for the best. You've been a good witness for me in Jerusalem, and now you're going to be my witness in Rome. The next day, the Jews worked up a plot against Paul. They took a solemn oath that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed him. Over 40 of them ritually bound themselves to this murder pact and presented themselves to the high priests and the religious leaders, saying this, We have bound ourselves by a solemn oath to eat nothing until we have killed Paul, but we need your help. We want you to send a request from the council to the captain to bring Paul back to the council chambers so you can investigate the charges in more detail, and we'll do the rest. While he's on his way, before he gets anywhere near you, we will kill him, and you won't be involved. Now, Paul's nephew, his sister's son, overheard them plotting this ambush, he went immediately to the barracks and told Paul. Paul called over one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the captain because he has something very important to tell him. The centurion brought the young man to the captain and said, The prisoner Paul asked me to bring this young man to you. He said he has something urgent to tell you. The captain took the young man by the arm and led him aside and asked him in private, What is it? What do you have to tell me? Paul's nephew told him, the Jews have worked up a plot against Paul. They're going to ask you to bring Paul to the council chambers in the morning on the pretext that they want to investigate the charges against him in more detail, but it's a trick just to get him out of your safekeeping so they can murder him. Right now, there are more than 40 men lying in the ambush for Paul, and they've all taken a vow neither to eat or drink until they've killed him. The ambush is set, and all they're waiting for you to do is send Paul over. The captain dismissed the nephew with this warning. Don't breathe a word of this to anybody. The captain called two centurions and said, Get 200 soldiers ready to go immediately to Caesarea. Also get 70 cavalry and 200 light infantry. I want them ready to march by 9 o'clock tonight. And you'll need a couple of mules for Paul and his gear. We're going to present Paul safely and soundly to Governor Felix. Then the captain wrote this letter from Claudius Lysias to the most honorable governor, Felix. Greetings. I rescued this man from a Jewish mob. They seized him and were about to kill him when I learned that he was a Roman citizen. So I sent in my soldiers. Wanting to know what he had done wrong, I brought him in before their council, and it turned out to be a squabble that had turned vicious over some of their religious differences, but nothing remotely criminal. The next thing I know... They had cooked up a plot to murder him. So I decided for his own safety, I'd better get him out of this town. So I'm sending him to you. I'm informing his accusers that he is now under your jurisdiction. The soldiers, following orders, took Paul that very same night to safety in, in Antipatris. In the morning, the soldiers returned to their barracks in Jerusalem. 
sending Paul on to Caesarea under the guard of the cavalry. The cavalry entered Caesarea and handed Paul the letter, Paul and the letter to the governor. After reading the letter, the governor asked Paul what province he came from, and Paul told him Cilicia. He said, I'll take up your case when your accusers show up. And then he ordered Paul to be locked up for the meantime in King Herod's official prison. Within five days, the chief priest Ananias arrived along with a contingent of leaders and Tertullus, a trial lawyer. They presented the governor with their case against Paul. When Paul was called before the court, Tertullus spoke up for the prosecution, and he said, Most honorable Felix, we are most grateful in all times and places for your wise and gentle rule. We are much aware that it is because of you and you alone that we enjoy this daily peace and profit from your reforms. I shall not tire you out with a long speech. I beg your kind indulgence for listening to me, and I will be quite brief. We have found this man time and time again, disturbing the peace and stirring up riots against Jews all over the world. He is the ringleader of a seditious sect called the Nazarenes. Really, he's a very bad apple. We caught him trying to defile our holy temple and arrested him. You'll be able to verify all these accusations when you examine him yourself. And all the Jews joined in. That's right, that's right. So the governor motioned to Paul and said, It was his turn. So Paul stood up and said this, I count myself fortunate to be defending myself before you, governor, knowing how fair-minded you have been in judging us all these years. I've been back in this country only 12 days. You can check these dates out easily enough. I came with the express purpose of worshiping in Jerusalem on Pentecost, and I've been minding my own business the whole time. Nobody can say they saw me arguing in the temple or working up a crowd in the streets. Not one of these charges can be backed up with evidence or witnesses. But I do freely admit this. In regard to the way, which they malign as a dead-end street, I serve and worship the very same God served and worshipped by all our ancestors, and I embrace everything written in our scriptures. I admit to living in the hopeful anticipation that God will raise the dead, both good and bad. And if that's my crime, my accusers are just as guilty as I am. Believe me, I do my level best to keep a clear conscience before God and my neighbors in everything I do. I've been out of the country for a number of years, and now I'm back. While I was away, I took up a collection for the poor, and I brought that with me along with offerings for the temple. It was while making these offerings that they found me quietly in my prayers at the temple. There was no crowd. There was no disturbance. It was just some Jews from around Ephesus who started all this trouble. And you'll notice they're not even here today. They're cowards. Too cowardly to accuse me in front of you. So, ask these others what crime they've caught me in. Don't let them hide behind the smooth talking turtles. The only thing they have on me is one sentence I shouted out in the council. I said, it's because I believe in the resurrection that I've been hauled into this court. Does that sound like grounds for a criminal case to you? But Felix, he knew far more about the way than he led on. He could have settled the case right then and there. But uncertain of his best move politically, he played for time. He said, when Captain Lysias comes down, I will decide your case. And then he gave orders to the centurion to keep Paul in custody, but more or less to give him the run of the place and not prevent his friends from coming to help him. A few days later, Felix and his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, sent for Paul and listened to him talk about the life of believing in Jesus Christ. As Paul continued to insist, on having right relationships with God and his people, and about a life of moral discipline, and about the coming judgment, Felix felt, felt things were getting a little too close for comfort and sent Paul away. He said, that's enough for now. I'll call you back when it's convenient. Now, at the same time, Felix was hoping Paul would offer him a substantial bribe to be the bribe to be set free. So these conversations happened over and over again. After two years of this, Felix was replaced by Porcius Festus, and still playing up to the Jews and ignoring justice, Felix left Paul 
in the prison. So when I listened to that, I heard I heard a man being a wise as a serpent and innocent as a dove. And it occurred to me that that's really important for all of us because, well, because we're all going to be in hot water sooner or later. And so we want to live as God would have us live and be able to walk through those situations. Let me give you a verse from Isaiah that really strikes home for me. It says, You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. What if you could fully realize that verse? I don't know anybody whose mind is stayed in perfect peace, but it's a goal. It's a good goal. What if, what if you could move closer to that verse today? What if, what if you could be a little bit more of this person today? And I, th- I think we all can as we reflect on what we learned from Paul today on how to operate in the world. Because that's what we're learning from Paul today, is how to operate in the world. And that's why Jesus uh, said this. We read it already. I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. So people who live trusting Jesus do what Jesus says, right? Jesus said this, if you love me, keep my commandments. And one of the things he said is to be wise. That's a good command. I'm glad he said that because I don't really want to be dumb. I'd much rather be smart. And uh, so I'm glad Jesus told us to do this. Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. So how do you be wise? We'll start with wise as serpents. Well, the, the, the beginning of wisdom, and we talked about this one, uh, I think it was last week, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom starts with getting everything in the right place, the square pegs and the square holes and the round pegs and the round holes, fearing the people you should fear most. And really, in the order, if you're, if you're talking about power and fear, then... Getting God on the top of your fear ladder is, in fact, the beginning of wisdom. That's not the relationship God wants with you, of course, but it's the beginning of things because now you are, well, yes, I'm afraid of, you know, I have an appropriate uh, fear of punishment for speeding, and I have appropriate fear of punishment for throttling people who are annoying me, and, I, and, and on up the ladder all the way to an appropriate fear of God because God is the ultimate judge of the world and he's the only one who will actually judge your soul. So, so the fear of the Lord is getting everything straight. And Paul has everything straight. He has to have everything straight to stand without fear against all these powerful people who are trying to get him killed because he knows whom he should fear the most. He has everything in order. That's wisdom. Having everything in order. Wisdom. And, and wisdom is also, wisdom is also this idea, not of just having of everything in order, but making decisions that are the best given all the circumstances around you. Understanding who's in the room and what's going on and, and being smart enough to be able to act within that in a smart way. And that's what Paul did. When he, when he was in the council and he saw, well, there's Sadducees and Pharisees here, and all he had to do was say one thing. Listen, it's because I believe in the resurrection of the dead that I'm here today. And all the Pharisees are like, well, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. And the Sadducees are all, yeah, yeah, done with the resurrection. We don't even believe in it. And so one little sentence, divided the room in half. You know what I call that? Smart. Smart, exactly. It was very cagey. He played the room well. Yeah, and, and that's important. It's important to realize because sometimes we can get this impression that, that because we are never to tell a lie, like I told the kids, Christians do not lie. But that doesn't mean we don't use wisdom. And Paul didn't lie, but he used wisdom. He didn't just stand there and let people do things to him. He was the actively engaged in what was going on and thinking through it and how best to deal with this situation. He was, he was in no way passive to that. He was smart, and he used it. And one of the things Jesus tells us, 
comes, uh, we, we learn from Jesus out of the incident where he was tempted, where Satan was tempting him. One of the temptations Satan gave Jesus was, listen, you say you're the Son of God, fine, whatever. Let's see if that's really true. And he took him up to the pinnacle of the temple. And he said, throw yourself down. Because the scriptures say he won't let you dash your foot against the stone. So why don't you just go ahead and prove it? And you know what Jesus said? He said, okay. No, he didn't. You guys know the scripture. Some of you know that. He turned to Satan and he said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And I think that's part of wisdom too. Because it's not faith to walk into a street without looking both ways. It's stupid, right? It's just not smart. It's not wise. And you can think about, there's tons of situations where some people might say, well, if you want to be a person of faith, but you know, Jesus tells us to act wisely. And there are times when it's wise to open your mouth and times when it's wise to shut your mouth. When Jesus was on trial, he didn't say anything. They kept accusing him, and they said, what, you're not going to say anything in your own defense? And at that point, he was doing God's will, and he just stayed quietly. And so what we see here with wisdom is thoughtful intention. It, there's, a, there's a mental engagement involved. There's a trying to understand everything. And this is what Christians are called to do. We're not called to just like, I'm a Christian, and I don't have to think. That is not at all the life that Christians are called to. We are called to be wise as serpents. In the story, we see Paul living with intentional, thoughtful, proactive uh, speech and action. And in, in, in the whole Bible, we see God acting with, with intentional action toward goals and, 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 and you know, moving things around. And, and even in Jesus' work, we see that. If you look at Jesus' work closely, there are times when it's not his time, so he goes and, and kind of leaves town. And there, when he's like going on a preaching tour, he says, okay, listen, um, I'm going to break you up into pairs, and you guys go to that town, and you guys go to that town, and you guys go to that town, and here's what's going to happen. I want you to come back and report to me. He's very thoughtful. He's very intentional about everything he's doing. And so that's the first thing. That's the wisest serpents. We are called to engage 100% with our brains, to live as wise a life as possible. Now, there are times when we do, we feel a special calling of the Lord to like act out in faith, but our default position is just simple, that living the best we can, not putting God to the test. So that's the first half, is to be wise. The second thing we see is that tell, be what I should have done this with the kids. Be wise, tell no lies. But I just figured that out, so. Anyway. Uh, so be wise and tell no lies. Be innocent as doves. That's the other thing. Don't even contemplate telling a lie. Don't wonder, should I tell a lie here? Because as soon as you wonder, then you're like Eve, going, oh, you know, with that apple, it looks pretty good, actually. Don't even contemplate telling lies. You might want to think about whether or not this is the right place, and it's the right time, and it's the right people to whom to say whatever's on your mind. But don't talk about, but don't, don't even uh, um, contemplate lying. So we want to live lives that are wise and innocent. But the lying, you know, that lying thing's kind of funny because sometimes, you know, you just want to keep your mouth shut. One time, on my birthday, my uh, wife, made me uh, steak kebabs. And they were delicious. Yes. I heard somebody. Yeah, I heard Randy. Randy loves food. <laughs> and they were grilled, and they were the steak cubes, and peppers, and onions, and all that stuff, and they were fantastic. And I was so thankful, because one of the things you guys have to know is that Kelly doesn't eat beef. She doesn't handle beef. She doesn't cut beef. And so I just assumed that... Um, that she had made these kebabs. And so I thanked her. That was so nice of you. And we didn't have any conversation about what I had assumed. So she didn't say anything. Because there was no call to say anything. Because I hadn't let her into my mind. And about three years later, I was telling somebody the story of my wife making me these kebabs. And how I couldn't believe how much she loved me. And I was picturing her, picturing her in there cutting the steak. 
and skewering it on these kebabs. I'm like, that is so unkelly. <laughs> and then she heard me talking, and of course, once you know that someone has gotten a false impression, then you are not free to leave it that way. <laughs> and she, she said, John, I have to tell you, you never asked me before, so I never told you, but I, I bought the kebabs already made. <laughs> <laughs> But there was a right place at the right time and everything, right? So she, she, um, she was wise as a serpent and innocent as a dove and that whole thing, and it turned out well. But there's a lot of things that are more serious than that. And you and I will encounter those things from time to time. I heard a story from another pastor uh, who had uh, somebody in Southern California uh, come into his office one day very, very upset. He was very upset. He had managed to climb up uh, the ladder to where he was a director, or vice president, some very high person at a company. And of course, you know, you do that and you live the lifestyle associated with the salary that is associated with that kind of position. And you got kids to feed and you got car payments to make and you just think everything's going to be fine. So, so you, uh, you know, you've got all your payments laid out, you know, you've got it all, it's all going to work out fine because you've tried to be wise and done all the calculations. And then he comes into the pastor's office. He says, I have a problem. I don't know what to do. I have uh, kids. I have a wife. I have a mortgage. I have car payments. I have everything. And uh, uh, my boss came into my office today and wanted me to sign something that I can't, that, I, that, that seems wrong to me there. And I think they were cooking the books. It was a long time ago. Something about they were, they were cooking the books. They were hiding something or whatever. And uh, I don't know what to do. And all the, all the pastor said is, you know what you have to do. Because Christians don't lie. Christians don't lie. And so the guy uh, went back and said, I, I can't be part of this. And the week after that, all his buddies were in the paper. Like this. <laughs> now it doesn't always turn out that way. But the way to have peace, remember that other verse we were looking at? I don't know if I put that back up there again. That, that other verse we were looking at, uh, it is, uh, what was, uh, he will keep him in perfect peace. Let me find this, I'm going to read it to you properly. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And that's what trust in Jesus looks like. Now there's more to it, and obviously trying to be wise is like a fuzzy, ongoing, daily kind of thing, because life is a fuzzy, ongoing, daily kind of thing, and we've got to kind of figure it out. But the goal is to be wise and innocent, because that's what Jesus said. I'm sending you out like sheep of a wolf, so be wise as serpents, and be innocent as doves. And the promise of the Bible is that he will keep your mind in perfect peace, the one whose mind is trusting him. So let's pray. Let's pray right now that we can all live wise and innocent lives so that we can move more in that peace that God desires for us. Father in heaven, uh, we read that your prophets speak your words that you will keep those in perfect peace whose mind trusts in you. And we hear Jesus tell us that loving him is keeping his commandments. And then we hear him say to his disciples that because we are in this world but not of this world, because heaven is our home, because we are called to be different as his followers, that we are like sheep, sheep going out among wolves. And so, Father, we want that peace. We want that peace in the middle of the most horrible circumstances that we find ourselves in. Help us to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. And I especially pray for people who are either in a moment of ambition, where they're like, they can just taste some sort of victory that they've been longing for. They can just taste it. It's right there. And they're tempted to... to uh, to just have a little compromise to take that last step. I want to pray for them to be strong, strong in you so that they can trust, trust deeply in you to be wise and innocent in 
all they're doing. And I also want to pray for people who are on the other end of the spectrum, the scale, that, that are, are more on the despair end, more like Paul in jail, and, and you don't know what's going to do, and it feels like a lot of people have a lot of power over you right now. I want to pray for them too, that, that you would just strengthen them in, with your Holy Spirit to, to give them trust in you, that it will enable them to be wise and innocent. Father, for all of us, we want the peace. The peace that comes with having our mind trust you. So help us to live lives that are wise and innocent. In Jesus' name.